Hey, good morning. Good to see all of you. Hope you're doing well. Um, so we're, we're moving towards getting a little bit more normal. Um, so let's just continue to pray that um, the coronavirus is, stays down. I know in some places it's, it's not the case, but for our area, we're doing pretty good. So we're thankful for that. We'll continue to be diligent and mindful of these things. I know for some of you it's a great concern. For some of you it's not a concern. And so let's just walk in grace and kindness with each other through this. We can love each other like this. This is not a big hurdle really for us to get over. This is an easy love hurdle, okay? So let's walk like that and just show that kind of kindness and respect. And I believe that you are. So um, thank you for that. All right. Well, how many of you read ahead to find out what I was going to teach on? You know, it's not a trick question. You don't feel bad if you didn't. But if you did, you're like, oh boy. And yeah, it's oh boy. Um, because of the, the time in which we are living. Not because of the passage. Um, we're going to take some time to look at it. But last week we talked about um, honoring widows. That's an easy one. That we should honor widows. We talked about honoring elders. That's, that's, that's a pretty easy pill to speak swallow as well but as we come into chapter 6 we find that bond servants slaves are told to honor their masters and so we want to take a look at this the title of the study and it's really hard because as we come out of these couple of verses and go into the next it's a hard transition and so I'm just calling the the uh, title based more on the second half of the study than the first half and we're calling it finding contentment so we're going to see Paul address slaves um, and how they should conduct themselves. Um, and, you know, here's the thing. Uh, teaching through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It brings us to the place, right, where we address every issue. I don't know that this would be the passage I would choose to teach on right now with all that's going on in our country. I, I'm not afraid to. I, I'm not ashamed of this passage. It's just, you know, if you weren't teaching through the Bible, I don't know this is a place you would want to go running to. So, yeah, the Word of God is taught. Um, why do we do it this way? Because we have to deal with every topic as it comes. Like it or not. Easy or not. And we have God's Word to instruct us and to teach us on this. Um, we're also going to see in this passage another warning about false teachers. And if we have the time, we'll get to the section where he talks about having contentment in this world. Well, let's read there in chapter 6, beginning at verses 1 and 2. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters... Let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those are benefited, are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So the first thing, and I'm going to come back to this and spend some time on it, but I, I feel like I need to front load this teaching with this. When we read about slavery in the New Testament or the Old Testament, we need to be able to make a distinction between what existed then and what existed in our country under African slave trade. So I'll come back to that in a moment, okay? But I just want you to know there's difference. Now, I'm not being simplistic and I'm not being naive. This was not a trip of a vacation to be a slave. Paul acknowledges that it's hard because he speaks about them having what? A yoke. So it's, it's not that this was just, you know, like you having a job. I'm not trying to equate it that, like that. But I also think it's important, and you will see why, I believe, that we understand that there is also some d important distinctions, one in particular. But let's just start with the text in front of us <clears throat> and these two matters that Paul addresses to the slaves. First of all, he says, if you have an unbelieving master... Make certain that he does not blaspheme the name of Christ because of your conduct. And so it's the, the, the important thing always, the most important thing always, is the salvation of a soul. And this is Paul's focus. This is why he gives an exhortation like that. I know many of you have the question, well, why doesn't he just come right out and call for the overturning, the abolition? We'll, we'll get to that in a moment as well. But let's just deal with this in front of us. And that is, he didn't want people, by having a, um, a, a, a slave, 
that was disrespectful and causing trouble to cause an unbeliever who had an opportunity with that believing servant in that household to hear the gospel. He wanted them to use, and all believers, to use every single circumstance, good or bad, for the cause of the gospel. Now this isn't just, you know, somebody writing that doesn't know about hardship and about difficulty. Many times Paul found himself on the uh, hard end of oppression and abuse and uh, being thrown into prisons and wrongly accused. And when having the opportunity um, to flee in Philippi, he chose to stay behind so that he might what? Preach the gospel to that Philippian jailer which ended up leading to his salvation and then to others. So Paul isn't just speaking some, from some ivory tower. He knows what it's like to be in difficult circumstances and still keep the priority of the gospel in the front. He then moves on in verse 2 to talk about what appears to be a problem with uh, the way believing masters were being treated. Quite a unique situation there in the first century world, you had, you had uh, many that were slaves because there was over 60 million at this time in the Roman Empire um, that were slaves. Many of them were making up the, the, the church, but so were many of the masters. And so you had them both sitting in a service, worshiping together, sharing in communion together, reading passages and letters from Paul that say things like, there's neither you know, Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor, nor female, bringing the, every member within the body of Christ onto that level of equality. We're all the same. But that didn't change the institutions and the prejudices and the chauvinism of the day. Those things still existed. And so Paul writes. Now, listen, what we don't find here, surprisingly, and it's been the reason for why many have brought charge against the Bible here and saying that, you know, this is, you know, if it was um, being fairly, you know, dealt with, then it would have had a lot to say to the masters. Well, who's Paul writing to? To Timothy. Where is Timothy? He's in Ephesus. Has that church ever received a letter before? Yeah, the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, we find uh, uh, you know, something that's being addressed to both the slaves and the masters again. But specifically, in verse 9, he says, And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with them. So he calls upon those Christian masters that were evidently having too heavy of a hand, and they were using threats of harm, to try and get them to move in a certain direction. Paul rebukes that and he calls them not to do that. And he calls them to remember that they've got a judge. And they're going to answer to the Lord one day. It, we, we don't know for certain, but the lack of Paul bringing this up again when he writes in here, chapter 6, it's possible that they heard that and they stopped threatening and they stopped mystery. We, we don't know, okay? But that is one plausible reason for why Paul does not address them again. But what may have come out of that is some of the slaves, feeling this freedom in Christ, were now thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't need to be your slave any longer as well. And so Paul says, listen, don't make it hard for them and don't take advantage of them because they're a believer. I realize that's a hard exhortation to hear. But that's what he gave and that's what he said to them. I think if we were to take this and apply it to our day, and I'm hesitant to do this in this hour and apply it to the employer-employee situation because I don't want to minimize this, the, the institution that existed and the difficulty that existed. It would be, again, probably naive and simplistic if we just tried to draw a straight line from this passage straight to your place of employment. However... There are applications that we can draw that if you had a Christian boss, don't use your, I had a, a really awesome time in the Lord, with the Lord this morning in a very long, quiet time praying. Praying for you in the business, by the way. That's why I'm an hour and a half late. 
You, you see the, the kinds of ways we could, we could do that? No, he says, you know, you don't want to do that. I'll let you kind of pick up the, the, the applications and run with it. But let me get to this point right here. Why doesn't the New Testament call for the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of all that were slaves? That's the question that we are confronted with often. And it's the reason why many have dismissed the Bible as being a relevant message to um, hear and the gospel is dismissed because they said, if this would have happened, then we would know who God really is. Well, here it is. The New Testament concerns itself with how a person will come to salvation and how the believer should conduct themselves who are in this present world system. It does not seek to throw off any of the institutions. Any of them. There were corrupt institutions that existed beyond slavery. There were, there were things like Nero. And the word is to show respect to those who are over you in authority. The exhortation is to honor those who are in authority over us and to obey those that are over us. Of course, unless it would cause us to disobey the Lord, then that stops. So we don't see this. The New Testament is concerned about the eternal kingdom, not this present hour. It focuses upon the heart of the individual and thus the collective hearts of the individual and the church and how they should function. That is how the New Testament is written. That is the focus. It is not trying to address the political and the cultural issues outside of an individual and the church. And so it doesn't take on those issues directly. Indirectly, I believe we have history that shows that when believers and people are changed by the gospel, they can have a profound impact upon those institutions and upon cultural issues. Um, injustices again many social issues that were um, out of place let me read to you a quote um, from Thomas Lee and Hayne Griffin he says Paul did not emphasize individual rights but individual responsibilities the chief concern for Paul was the glory of God not the manumission of the slaves or an increase in privilege for the owners Equality before God, Galatians 3, 28 and 29, does not guarantee that all human beings enjoy equal roles and life status. While Paul both accepted a different status for master and slave, he demanded a changed attitude from both. From both. So the believers are instructed on how to conduct themselves in this difficult circumstance. Jesus gave similar exhortations to his own countrymen. If a soldier it compels you to go one mile, gather all your friends and call for insurrection. Is that what he says? It doesn't say that, does it? If, a, if a, somebody who's occupying your land seizes upon you and compels you to go one mile, what does Jesus say to do? Go two. Go two. Why? Is he, is he saying that the occupation of Israel was a righteous thing? He's not saying that. He's saying there's an opportunity there. <laughs> there's an opportunity. And we are to be different. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in a similar kind of don't emphasize your own individual rights. When, when one person in the body of Christ was taking advantage of another and they were thinking about going to court Paul says to them rather than worrying about your rights why don't you just rather be wronged then get in front of courts and the in the world and they see believers fighting and arguing the kingdom of God is more important and so we see these types of exhortations given again I, I mentioned already but just Paul gave exhortations to obey the government that was oppressive, and in, in many cases, was persecuting the church. And yet he calls them to be obedient. So this is the focus of the New Testament, not just on one issue, okay? But on all of those issues, it's to check the heart. So what does the Bible teach about slavery? Well, let's start in the Old Testament. And I'm just going to go through these points real quick. Um, they are worthy of more attention, but you'll catch the point. I said in the beginning that the slavery, the African slave trade, 
um, that took place in this country was different than the Old Testament and the New Testament. How so? Here it is. Um, first of all, from the Old Testament, a slave could voluntarily decide to stay as a slave. It was a different kind of an institution. If they found it to be a good uh, place for them, working and otherwise, they could remain with that person. Deuteronomy 15. When a slave was freed, he was to receive gifts that enabled him to survive economically. Deuteronomy 15, 14. Very different than what happened in this country when the slaves were freed. A Hebrew slave could become free after six years of service, released during the year of Jubilee, by marriage of the master's son. So again, you can see that there was a different kind of way in which they looked at it. This was not so much a race based uh, form of slavery um, or if refused was able to be set free if they didn't want to be married then they could be set free if they were injured Exodus 21 verses 26 through 27 they could be set free and by purchasing their own freedom Leviticus 25 verse 47 um, also an escaped slave was not to be returned as property to the owner Deuteronomy 23, verses 15 through 16. If a slave left, they were not, and they, they found lodging in another place, they were not to return that slave to whoever the master was. Um, the slave was a member of the master's household. They were brought in as part of the family. Was required to, they were required to have a rest on the Sabbath. They could inherit property. They could be in charge of entire household and often, sometimes, I'll say, were trusted advisors. 1 Samuel chapter 9. A treatment of a slave was never to be severe. Again, Le Leviticus 25. A master who punished his slave who then died was to be punished himself, possibly even with death. Exodus 21.20. 20. They were considered, not to again make... <laughs> Uh, to kind of gloss over this, they were considered a form of property, but not in the strictest sense, because if they ran away, they were not to be returned as property. And then I think significantly, and we'll pick up this point in the New Testament as well, kidnapping someone to make them a slave was prohibited, Amos chapter 1 verse 6, and was punishable by death. So you see, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it out like being a slave was... Um, you know, a cush job. That is not what I'm trying to say. I'm just, I'm wanting you to see that it was very different. The New Testament, not exactly like Old Testament slavery, but probably more closer to, to that than what we experienced here in this country. So it's important to read this as we read the Bible and we come across the word slave or master that we don't infuse all of our um, historical and cultural understanding in this country into the Bible. We always have to let the context of when it was written come forth so we can properly apply it. Apply it. I've already mentioned, but nearly a third of all people were slaves under the Roman Empire. Freedom was something that was possible in the Roman Empire. A slave could get that. A, a slave could receive payment that could be saved towards buying their freedom. Many of them received inheritances. They became spouses of the owner's children on occasions. One could come and sell themselves into slavery rather than to uh, find themselves in a destitute situation and not be able to feed their own family. And so this happened. But again, let's be honest, many were harsh and cruel and treated them terribly. Thus Paul says, you've got a master, you better watch what you do you're going to give an account. So for the Christian, that would have dealt with the, the, the most um, egregious form of, uh, or a consequence of being in that situation. So th this is kind of what it was like in the first century world. Well, what does the New Testament teach? Well, we, we kind of picked up on it a little bit here. You wanted to be a witness. If you were a slave, you were to be a witness. If you were free, you were to be a witness. If you're a Jew... Be a witness. If you're a Gentile, be a witness. If you're a man, be a witness. I mean, if you're a woman, be a witness. Everybody was called to participate in the most important campaign this world has ever heard of or seen. 
And that is a proclamation of the gospel. To us, to all people, was entrusted the most precious thing on planet Earth, the gospel. And all of them were called to participate in that, even those that found themselves in the most difficult circumstances. We read it, but in Ephesians 6, they were to- called to let their, well, let their work be done as unto the Lord. Well, actually, we didn't read it, but just prior to the verses 5 through 8 of chapter 6, talks about let their work be done unto the Lord. Don't just look at your circumstances as unfortunate and you're, you're under somebody else's authority and, you know, this is just miserable and I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Paul says, listen, our God is sovereign and you do that work unto the master as unto the Lord and you will be rewarded. How that would have changed their, their, their heart and their mind as they went about doing those, those deeds. It didn't make them free in one sense, but boy, knowing that you were doing it as unto the Lord could bring such a joy in the work that would have otherwise been just only miserable. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, if possible, if you're a slave, if possible, get your freedom. Paul exhorted Philemon, a Christian brother who had slaves, to show grace to Onesimus, who was a runaway slave and had done some harm to his household, Ended up running away, ended up getting arrested, and ended up being in jail with Paul. (laughs) And they had this common friend named Onesimus. Paul led him to the Lord. Paul writes to Philemon and says, listen, um, I know that he's done you wrong, but um, I would ask that you would charge all that to my account. I've done much for you. Let him go. Don't hold this against him. He's become useful for the kingdom of God to me. And so he calls for the emancipation of Onesimus. And this is a point that I believe escapes us today, but it has to be seen as highly significant. Again, you had slaves and masters that were in church together. It was common in that day, not always the case, but it was common in that day that a master would never allow a slave to have any kind of moral or philosophical conversation or instruction. Because they viewed them as being beneath that. They did view them many times as simply like livestock or some kind of property. So they never wanted them to be instructed. They wouldn't address them on that level. But you know what? When you came to church, that's all you got. You got spiritual and moral, and yeah, there's a philosophical instruction, that a Christian philosophy that was being embedded into their hearts and their minds. And in that setting, the, the, the slave could be challenged as well as the master in their direct relationship, but on any other area of kindness and gentleness and self-control. If the master wasn't kind and gentle and walking in self-control and not being generous, then he was being rebuked in the congregation. And the slave was sitting there hearing it. And so we may look at that and not think anything of the fact that slaves were being addressed, but in that day, it was revolutionary that that would take place. Again, we can just read our present context into um, past events in the Bible and we failed to miss the significance of what was going on I've already mentioned it but Galatians 3 28 and 29 there was no class distinction between free and slave and when you went it when you were saved before God and in the household of the Lord everybody was on the same level so these are some of the teachings one last thing that I think is probably among the most significant as we think of it in terms of the question why was this allowed? In 1 Timothy 1.10, and you might want to just turn back there, to just back a few pages. Well, I'll just back up to verse 9. It says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So the, the word here for kidnapper, some of your translations may say even have slave trade. 
And so this is what this view has, this word has in view, was the idea of slave trade. That we mentioned that the Old Testament forbade as well. Going and capturing somebody against their will, taking them and selling them. Do you realize that if this one exhortation would have been obeyed, there would have never been a single African slave on this continent. So to say that the Bible is silent, I, I understand that. When we say that, we're like, why doesn't it call for um, you know, abolishing in a, of slavery and, and emancipation? Well, understand, we're talking about two systems. But, but I still understand that. But what was said was significant. It was so significant that if it had been followed, slavery would have not existed in this country, at least in the form that we are familiar with. It wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Sadly, though, the church in many, and I really can't, I don't know, maybe most, I'm not familiar enough with the history of it, but many, possibly in most instances, was complicit and silent against this crime against humanity that the Bible clearly was forbidding. And the church should have stood up and should have spoke up much louder, and there should have been many more of them, but it was a few that did. And the Lord was able to use them. These are men and women whose hearts had been changed. I'm not saying everybody who was an abolitionist was a Christian, but many were. Probably the one person who had uh, the greatest impact upon African slave trade that the New Testament forbids was a man by the name of William Wilberforce. He is fr from England. And he was a, 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 came from a family of, of means, was incredibly wealthy, was in the parliament, um, kind of was a wild, wild, wild guy until he got saved. And when he got saved, he just began to see the priorities of the word of God and the mission work. And he looked at it and he says, I, I can no longer be in the parliament. I, I, I don't want to do this. I've got to go do other things with my, my efforts and my time. And the prime minister at the time just begged him not to do that. He said, no, we need you. We need you. I need you in this fight against, um, uh, uh, to call for abolition and eventually emancipation. And he's like, I just don't know. And he was, he was turning in his resignation and, and his friend says, please, just think on this. And so William Wilberforce went and had a meeting with a pastor by the name of John Newton, a former slave trader himself that got saved and wrote Amazing Grace, right? And he went to him. He's like, no, no, no. Don't you quit. You stay there. And use this for the glory of God. And he did. And it was through his efforts and many other people that finally, when the majority shifted and they were able to get control, they, um, they abolished the slave um, trade, um, although it continued to go on. And eventually the emancipation came right before he died. And it had profound impact what happened there upon what took place in the United States. And there are people in our own country that had and stood up as well against this. And the, the, the names are long, of course. A freedman himself, Frederick Douglass, did so much of this. But there also was a guy by the name of Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Constitution, who started the first um, abolitionist society in the country. He was a believer. And others, a Quaker by the name of Moses Brown, who, whose family was involved in slavery, he became a, uh, an abolitionist, uh, abolitionist as well. So, yes. As individuals, it's being addressed. But when the hearts of people are changed, then it becomes possible on a personal level to make differences. But God then raises up people. And wherever your voice is, we want to always speak out for those that are oppressed and those that are beaten down. I'm talking like slavery is over. Slavery is not over. Now, it's illegal in this country, and we don't see it today, but the conservative number, and it's a broad number, the conservative number of people that are believed to be enslaved today is 24 million, as high as 48 million people. And so, you know, there's, it depends on how you count slavery and your estimates, but even the low number, 
This is something we can still speak out against. And, uh, do you ever read history and you read a guy like William Wilberforce that was willing to fight and go uphill completely and wonder, would I be one that was willing to do it? And he suffered greatly in his personal life and in his own health because of it. All right? You know, it's like, would I be a man, would you be a woman that would go against the tide, keeping the main thing the main thing, which was the gospel, but also as a changed man or woman, looking to use that to help the oppressed and he did but a changed heart brought this now there's still more that needs to go on there are again 24 million at the least that are in slavery today how about the those unborn children that are being put to death while still in their mother's womb this is an issue for us to be concerned about it's not the only issue but it is certainly an issue as are those that are in slavery right now how about Christians that are being targeted and being persecuted? Christians are being persecuted more than any other religion in the world today. You have brothers and sisters that have been taken. Um, and brothers have watched their, their daughters and their wives taken away into sex slave trade because they're followers of Jesus Christ. Listen, there's a lot of nasty stuff that still goes on in this world today. And we need to be willing to be there to show mercy to the oppressed. That is what the Bible calls us to do. So, yeah, I didn't get nearly as far as I wanted to. So I'm going to, rather than trying to speed through, I'm just going to allow this to kind of bring us to, to the end. Why did I want to dive in like this? Because it's a relevant issue. It's, a, it's a, the topic that's, that's uh, in conversation, is, uh, in accusations brought against the church. You need to know. Some of those accusations against the church that failed to teach the word of God or twist the word of God to allow the institution to go on or to not stop it, they deserve, it deserves to be called out. It was wrong. Any portion of scripture that's twisted deserves to be called out. And that happened. Well, praise the Lord that there were people that ended that. And um, yet... I think we see in our country, although the slavery has ended and segregation has ended, there are still all kinds of hurt and pain that exists in this country and tension that you see every time you turn on the news. But you know, we need to be willing to speak to that and address that. The Bible tells us how to love people. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, loving people is in the center of our bullseye, right? We're good at that. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us to love people. This is what we need to do. This is how we should be walking and conducting ourselves to all people. To all people. And to, to know what the Word of God says. And when the challenges come against you, uh, you know, go back, listen to the study, and find these passages. Because I'm of the persuasion most people don't know what the Bible has to say about slavery. They see the word and now they go. <laughs> and they don't understand what it actually has to say. So whatever your circumstances are today, no matter how difficult or how hard as we make an application, we should use that for the cause of the gospel. We should use that for the gospel's sake. Now listen, there, I, this is the warning I want to give. There are all kinds of groups that are out there right now and they're stepping forward to address some social injustices that are present. That is fine. But you need to know who you're joining with. You need to know who you're partnering with. If you're partnering with a group that wants to help this social injustice, but at the same time wants to encourage people to go live a life of sin, that's not the group you want to be associated with. Take a moment, take some time, and that should not slow us down in doing what is right and showing mercy and compassion to those that are in need. We, we, we can handle this. We, we can do both of these things. We can care for the oppressed, and we can preach the gospel. But here's my warning. If the church picks up social issues to the exclusion of her primary calling, which is to worship God, equip the saints, and preach the gospel, 
this is going to be the worst thing that the world could possibly see. The gospel must be preached, and it does not tie our hands in giving a cup of cold water to someone in need. We can do them both, and we should do them both. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us to take this in and digest it, to understand it, to be able to speak to those who bring accusation. Lord, we know you're the one who says all people are equal, neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek. Lord, you died for all people. And this is your word. We were all made in your image. So Lord, we pray that we would live like the very things you believe and you teach us and you instruct us. Lord, we do pray for our country. Lord, this country is just pulling apart. And we pray that we would speak up with love and compassion, giving a cup of cold water where a cup of cold water is needed, but not failing to proclaim the gospel. Lord, open doors for us, for me today, for us today. Open doors to, to make, to bridge that gap and to see people come to salvation. Oh Lord, we, we need a revival. We need to see this happen. We need more godly people that we, like a William Wilberforce, to have the wisdom to know how to walk both of these out. May we be those people, Lord. We pray for your grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. As we go, let's go with grace in our hearts towards one another and all people. And if you don't have that, then today's a good day to repent of that. It's a good day to get rid of it. Go with forgiveness in your heart towards all people. And if you don't have forgiveness in your heart, today's a good day to pray about that. And so let's be a light in our community. It's not time for us to be quiet. It's time for us to speak the truth of God's word in love with reason. And we can do that.